Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand for the arrival of Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados. And please remain standing for the national anthem.
please be seated. Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, Mr. Frundel Stewart, former Prime Minister, members of the Diplomatic Corps, senior government officials, immediate family of the Honorable George Laming, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today's memorial, a tribute to the man and his words, celebrates the life and legacy of our acclaimed man of letters, the Honorable George Laming, and gives us pause to reflect on his genius and significant contribution to the literary world. Today, among the moving tributes from his family, friends, and colleagues, and the renditions of some of his favorite genres of music, I will read some of his words. Words just as powerful and poignant today as today they were first penned. George Laming wrote, there is a moment when a man's utterance cannot catch and convey the shape and shade of his thoughts and feelings. Language, it seems, has actually surrendered just when his need is greatest. It is then he requires this weapon of words to enter that hidden area of his consciousness and bring back with it, so to speak, the kind of picture which another's eye cannot conceive. An excerpt from In the Castle of My Skin. And to deliver the first tribute, please welcome to the stage Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Our beloved president of our republic, our beloved prime minister, the Lamin family, and all friends this morning. We celebrate the contribution of a brother, an elder, our most distinguished man of letters and our society, a progeny, a genius who emerged from the grassroots of our colonial world to become a global intellectual respected on all continents for his contribution to the emergence of modernity characterized by the pillars of freedom and liberation. He was undoubtedly a master of the literary form and construct we call the novel. And when we imagine that he had mastered that form before the age of 25, having written that most extraordinary intellectual product called In the Castle of My Skin, and he had started to draft that novel around the age of 21, to be published a few years later. That should give you a sense of the phenomenal mind that we are celebrating today, a genius of the literary form. But he was very keen to allow his 
talents to go beyond the parameters of that literary construct. He was an extraordinary essayist. An orator with a thunderous voice and capacity. He was an artist of the public space and together we came to know George as a scholar, philosopher, political activist, and critically a warrior against the evil of empire. There was an effort, no doubt, after the Clement Paine Revolution of 1937 to turn back those progressive forces that were unleashed in Barbados. There was an effort, a literary and intellectual effort, and a political effort to legitimize the concept of Little England, to brand that imagery and iconography upon our society. George declared an intellectual war upon that effort. How can it be Little England? How can it be celebrated as the heart of an evil empire? How can the most tyrannical system of imperial government emerging in its most matured form in Barbados, how could it be legitimized as a modern construct? Most of his utterings, his essayings, and his oratory, most of it was built around that need for the cultural revolution to free Barbados, to free the Barbadian people and to free all of the people of the Caribbean and indeed all people who had been subject to imperial injustice. He traveled to Cuba, embraced and legitimized the Cuban revolution as the Caribbean finest expression of its will to freedom. The Caribbean's most distinguished effort to chart its own sovereignty. The Caribbean finest expression of a people emerging to assert their right to be. And from his association with the spirit of the Cuban Revolution, he embraced all of those revolutionary efforts to uproot imperialism from the Caribbean. He joined forces with Maurice Bishop in Grenada. He joined forces with Walter Rodney in his effort to construct a multiracial sensibility in Guyana. And he traveled all over the world, in Africa, joining forces with the effort to decolonize the continent and to allow the African people to rise. George Lamin was a Barbadian Caribbean global intellectual and cultural revolutionary. He was the most extraordinary thinker 
of the existential problems associated with decolonization. He was, for my generation that came thereafter, he was the patron of the anti-plantation posse and all of the manifestations of what the plantation represented and did. It's brutalization of the workers, the people, the women, the children. The evil of that history he thought had to be exposed. George Lamin represented the energy force that constituted the search for the freedom of the mind and the freedom of the soul. The eternal struggle for justice. He believed that that was not only a political construct, it was a moral and social and intellectual effort. All of his life, he dedicated to that cause of liberation, freedom, and justice. We thanked him for his vision and his leadership. We surrounded him as he aged and his powers were diminished. We surrounded him with the friendship and the empowerment that he needed in his latter years. We at the university at Cave Hill, we were blessed to bring him into our center, into our bosom. We created a space called the George Lamin Pedagogical Center. Pedagogical because we wanted all academic thought, all scholastic visioning to be associated with the mentality George had invested in us. We gave him a room, an office, an oasis overlooking the ocean where he could come, he could sit, look out on the Caribbean Sea. It's full archipelago and where he could receive his guests, students, friends, the media from all over the world to come and hear his final engagements. We had the honor also of resurrecting after many decades BIM magazine, where his early work had been published and called upon him to be the editor of this new BIM, Arts for the 21st Century, and ask him to preside over the resurrection of this literary institution. I can share with you that that twinkle of the eye that characterized George's smile. We saw that twinkle. And when we saw that twinkle in his eyes, we knew that we had done the right thing and that he was, he was pleased. And so we say farewell. We celebrate that a man, a woman can only do the best they can. 
and to pass the baton on to the next generation. George was a philosopher of that concept and he certainly did more than we had expected of him for us, for us, the people of the Caribbean, the people of the emerging world who had been tortured for 500 years and are now finding our place. He was our enlightenment. What more can anyone give than enlightenment to show the way forward? I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. To deliver the second tribute, Dr. Alison Leacock, representing the Combermere School, Mr. Lamming's alma mater. Good morning, Madam President, Madam Prime Minister, family of the Honorable George Lamming, distinguished guests all. I've been asked to represent the Common Mayor School, whose board of management I have the honor to chair. And in his own words, the Honorable George Lamming said, apropos Common Mayor School, Combermere, I haven't quite been able to work out. To this day, I meet people generations later, and I don't know any school in Barbados whose products claim their school as a Combermerian does. They call it a Combermere mafia. <laughs> and we can tell where they're seated. It is just doesn't matter across generations. It's a peculiar thing, he said, that I've never seen among the products of any other school. His words resonate, whether you were among the first girls in sixth form, as I was, or you are among the old scholars and the alumni from the US or the UK. We were all infused with that ethos that is Combermere. I recall my immense pride as a young 25-year-old, the very first manager of this beautiful, exquisite building. And the fact that it was named after a fellow Combermerian was not lost on me. The convergence of Combermerians is no coincidence today as we celebrate the man and his work in his mentor's hall. The Combermere family honored George Lamming at the Blue Ribbon Dinner when the late Gladstone Holder penned an erudite and eloquent citation saluting his contribution to literature and the allure of his life. The school commits to honoring his legacy. Dr. Carl Wade recalls Lamming's relationship with Combermere from the 1930s and the influence of Frank Cullimore, the teacher, the midwife, if you will, of Caribbean literature and the editor of BIM magazine. Lamming himself writes, it wasn't by chance that I dedicated my first book to Frank Cullimore, whom I have known as a teacher and a friend since 1939. As a schoolmaster at Commermere, where I spent six or seven years, and later as the editor of BIM, he played an important part in my life and the lives of other young men, as could be expected. Cully allowed him access to his personal library and gave him moral support during difficult times. Lamming became an inspiration and a model to aspiring writers from his alma mater. He contributed significantly to the emergence of the school as a center for literary creativity. 
produced Austin Clark, the prolific iconoclastic novelist and short story writer. Timothy Callender, the talented and popular short story writer. And Anthony Kelman, the poet and novelist, each from a very different generation. It is an enviable record for a single school. To these authors, Lamming demonstrated the idea of the writer as another worker, returning the experience of Barbadian and West Indian society to itself. It is, to quote our Prime Minister, the relay of Caribbean development, and for us, the repertoire of Combermere creativity. That creativity is also captured in this cameo from Dean Emeritus Harold Critchlow, who says, our relationship really began after George Lamming left Combermere. Though in age we were separated by several years, we were both mentored at Combermere by the legendary and highly respected Frank Cullimore, whom we both admired. Cully played a large part in both of our lives at school, coming to our rescue and setting us on paths for our respective life endeavors, mine as a priest, his as an author, both voices of active social conscience. George and I, however, though apart for many years pursuing our studies and careers abroad, still found time when in Barbados to discuss our respective memories of Combermere, our experiences in England and Jamaica in particular, the development of Barbados as, as well as emerging social and philosophical issues across the wider Caribbean and the world. I can still feel the cool breezes of the East Coast and picture the views of the sea from the Atlantis Hotel as we shared experiences. I had the distinct honor of being asked to read some passages from In the Castle of My Skin a few years ago at the Barbados Public Library at an event in tribute to his work. I readily accepted the invitation as I consider this a seminal work. He was a brilliant Combermarian of great stature who has contributed immensely to the corpus of world literature. He was one of the finest Barbadian writers, a true Caribbean man, a world citizen whose writings have made an impact on the lives of many here and abroad and will continue to do so for many years to come. I will forever treasure our friendship. Up and on, my friend, rest in peace. From Dean Emeritus, Harold Critchlow. On behalf of the Board of Management, the principal, staff, past and present Combermarians, we say thank you to his family for sharing George Lamming with us. It is fitting that he should have the last word from the West Indian people of 1966. It's an inspiring challenge that still seems relevant, a challenge for us to use art to shape human life. The architecture of our future is not only unfinished, the scaffolding has hardly gone up. George Lamming now joins a pantheon of Combermere masters of cricket, literature, and art. Keep the flame burning brightly ever, up and on. Thank you very much, Dr. Alison Leacock, representing which school again? the Combermere School. In 1992, George Lamming wrote, the work of art, be it theater, music, novel or poem, is not seen primarily by the artist as a call to revolution, or a call to anything else, or as a celebration of victory. Artistic expression can do those things, and in particular situations may regard or must regard this function as its priority. 
but the central and seminal value of the creative imagination is that it functions as a civilizing and humanizing force in a process of struggle. It offers an experience through which feeling is educated, through which feeling is deepened, through which feeling can increase its capacity to accommodate a great variety of knowledge. Please welcome the children of the George Lamming Primary School singing their school song, Imagine, Create, and achieve. The pupils of the George Lamming Primary School. The next tribute will be delivered by Professor Aaron Kamugisha, representing the PJ Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean Advocacy. President, the Most Honorable Sandra Mason, Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, distinguished guests, members of the Laming family. I'm honored today to read the tribute from 
the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, and statesman in residence at the P.J. Patterson Center for Africa-Caribbean Advocacy. The entire Caribbean has been jolted by a loss of volcanic enormitude with the muting of one of its most powerful voices, the death of novelist, poet, storyteller, and political advocate, George Lamming. True to form, George seemed to have written his final earthly statement by quietly passing from this world and missing the national, regional, and international celebration of his life by timing his death for three days before he reached his 95th year, as if it would have been too much for him. It is difficult to explain and perhaps impossible for the generation of today to understand why, though, for those of us who were students in the decades of the 50s, George Lamming is such an epic and venerable figure. For us, the publication, In the Castle of My Skin, is indelibly etched alongside Roger Bannister's running of a first sub four minute mile and Yuri Gagarin's first Sputnik voyage. These were life changing experiences we will never forget. As pupils in the most outstanding grammar schools throughout the region, we had mastered the literature of England, its prose, poetry, drama, and novels. So too for the language specialists of Spanish and French, who were well read in the masterpieces of France and Spain. Those who pursued the honors degree in literature were taught Anglo-Saxon at UCWI and medieval English as well. But there was no space for the creative output of our Caribbean writers. Dialect and Creole were completely out of the question. In the quest for self-discovery, those scholars gifted with an inquisitive mind yearned for the indigenous writings about our African ancestry and Caribbean heritage. In the Castle of My Skin was a welcome fountain for which we yearned. We devoured the enticing feast from cover to cover and delved deeply into the legacy and atrocities of racism and oppression that it observed and exposed. There soon followed a steady flow by other distinguished West Indian authors, but it was George Lamming who opened the tap. He is a dominant, a pioneer who, in a wide range of literary gems thereafter, has emerged as an indomitable revolutionary legend. George was a Caribbean man to the core. His mentor and friend, Frank Collimore, had lit a Caribbean fire in him that drove him to reach out to artists throughout the Caribbean. He revealed in his transcendental writings, in his powerful readings on the BBC, as a teacher in the West Indies and later in the United States, Europe, Australia and Africa, the essence of the Caribbean and the similarities he found with the continent of Africa. Few writers and intellectuals have been as preoccupied or as successful as Lamming was with exploring and interrogating the survival of Africa and the indomitable African spirit within the diaspora, despite many centuries of attempted deculturation and indoctrination. While he made his name with his first novel, his most outstanding philosophical contributions were comparable with those of the giants of his time, like Leopold Senghor, M.A. Césaire, C.L.R. James, and Franz Fanon. His thundering voice, wherever he spoke to audiences of learning, touched the hearts of the African and Caribbean diaspora in our struggles for freedom, equality, and justice. His many books are all superb chronicling of Caribbeanness the journey of exile, the search for Caribbean identity, and the building of a Caribbean civilization. The Guyana and Bayesian issues of New World Quarterly that he selected and edited are masterpieces in their own right. Lamming had a visceral connection to the working class of the Caribbean and passionately supported trade union activism. Their struggles and triumphs were not simply material for theoretical philosophizing, but the subject of realistic grounding and daily experiences which centered his outlook and worldview. I too was privileged in his later years to benefit from the quiet tete-a-tete -tete in which he shared his vision for the Caribbean civilization, the concept of the archipelago and the surrounding mainland nations of Belize, Guyana and Suriname being all together one people. The master called him home when he could no longer speak with clarity and authority. 
Lamming helped to lay the conceptual framework for Caribbean and African decolonization and independence. He was a colossus of his time, whose work will last well beyond the years he shared with us. The P.J. Patterson Center for Africa-Caribbean Advocacy wishes to extend sincere condolences to his friends and family and colleagues in the literary world, academia, politics, and the trade union movement. The words of his friend and colleague, the incomparable Guyanese poet Martin Carter, are most up for the occasion. Now, from the morning vanguard, moving on, dear comrade, I salute you, and I say death will not find us thinking that we die. George Lamming's pen is now at rest, but his writings and constant message of confidence in our strengths and capacity to realize our own destiny will remain immortal. He was a trailblazer who has charted the path for his generation and others yet unborn. We must not let his legacy die. His vision and voice must live on during the ages ahead. Thank you from PJ Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica. I now invite Professor Richard Drayton to deliver a tribute. Family and friends of George Lamming, fellow citizens. George was a worker, urgent, restless, up late at night, early in the morning, his work a kind of prayer. Wherever he went, a little cloth bag with books, paper, pen, reading, rereading, making wild diagrams of notes to be spun in staccato bursts of typewriting. George was a giver of gifts. Forty years ago this year, when I went to university, George reached into his things and gave me a turtleneck, which I still have, saying, with that smile, Boston is cold, you will need this. He was a kind man whose kindness was anchored in the care for the future. When he gave a book, it was inscribed for Natasha, for Dahlia, for Hillary, for Richard, never to. The gift was not a transfer of property. It was an expression of solidarity with us and with what we might become. When George spoke, it was like a potter with clay. The play of fingers formed a vessel, cut an outer shape, but also an inner void, like the cavern of a drum where meanings echoed for those who dared to hear. No potter or maker of words knows how others' hands or ears will comprehend what they make. But they give, and George gave, passing these vessels, poems, novels, speeches, in hope and faith and love, towards the future, to us, and to those to come towards what we and them and the world might become. George was a revolutionary. That is to say that he was a man whose whole life was a fight against the grip of the past on the present, a fight towards a future where we would be whole human beings, head joined to heart and hand in a society which he understood in Marxist terms, for he was a Marxist from the age of 20, which would offer, which would take from each according to her ability and offer to each according to his need. He ended his speech to the graduates at Cave Hill in 1980, a kind of manifesto speech which marked the moment in his life when he chose to return and live in what he called with such affection, the region, with the poem of Martin Carter. And so, if you see me looking at your hands, listening when you speak, marching in your ranks, you must know I do not sleep to dream, but dream to change the world. In that same year when he buried Walter Rodney, 
George reminded us, for democracy has never, never been an organic part of our experience, from conquest through slavery and colonization to the present arrangements we endure. And what is called the subversion of democracy is often a conscious and courageous effort to exorcise those twin demons of the tyrant which have pursued us from the past. George was at war with those twin demons, for he understood slavery and colonialism as spiritual conditions which persisted long after the formal end of these institutions, deforming our public and private lives. His particular enemy was what he saw as the catastrophic alienation of our head from our body, of the educated elites from the creative energy of the masses, from the people of down below, a spiritual fracture anchored in the past and in present social and economic inequality. His particular concern was the political class. Williams, Barrow, and Manley, and even Fidel Castro, who he admired in many ways, but who ruled from above, inhabiting the autocratic style of Columbus, of the planter, of the colonial governor. It was that fracture between the big men and women of what he called federal drive, the men and women of parliament, of the university, and the sufferers of down below, which he prophesied in 1960 would cause the death of the West Indies Federation, and which he feared undermined the potential of every post-colonial Caribbean nation. The spirit of George moves me to say that his feelings about our celebration this morning are mixed as we, as we rehearse a ritual for a privileged 100, 200, while outside the streets are filled with strugglers fighting to live, with dreams and visions, with words, but without the power to be heard. If George was angry with us at times, it was an anger reached from the deepest wells of love a rage against how we were imprisoned by our origins, by our many kinds of complacency, a rage which, helped to help, which aimed to help us to free ourselves towards the fullest realization of our human potential. That was his hope and faith for us in Barbados and across the family of societies from Cuba to the Guyanas. It is now our hard and bitter work to make sense of his life and our loss, to receive and understand his gifts, to rescue from the waste of mortality all his generous and heroic ambitions, to continue the work of self-emancipation, of making just and equal societies. Wherever we work for the liberation and unity of the Caribbean, the spirit of George Lamming will be our companion. Thank you very much, Professor Richard Drayton. We'll now have a performance of Deep River by Shanika Roach, accompanied by John Bryan on piano.
Shanika Roach, accompanied by John Bryan. In 2003, George Lamming wrote, but I believe that labor and the social relations experienced in the process of labor constitute the foundations of culture. It is through work that men and women make nature a part of their own history. The way we see, the way we hear, our nurtured sense of touch and smell, the whole complex of feelings which we call sensibility is influenced by the particular features of the landscape which has been humanized by our work. So there can be no history of Trinidad or Guyana that is not also a history of the humanization of those landscapes by African and Indian forces of labor. An excerpt from the Sovereignty of the Imagination delivered at a conference in his honor hosted by the Center of Caribbean Thought, UWI Mona, in 2003. We will now have a tribute from Esther Phillips, Poet Laureate. Madam President, Madam Prime Minister, Natasha and family, specially invited guests. I'll read two poems. The first one is related to the earlier part of the friendship between George and myself. The second one is closer to the last years. Arrival. Why now? Why now this evening time when, as you say, your flag is flying at half-mast? And captain, oh my captain, what is this cargo that you bring me? Stones of sapphire turning to stars between your fingers? Rubies gleaned where the river bends at Bellevue, Saint Souci? Such was the bunk to you brought another love who counted with leaves, tender and green from the woods in spring, your vows of homecoming. I could have told her. Oh, I could have told her leaves wither and glass houses splinter. I too have gathered stones on a faraway shore where the hurricane's eye swollen slept for a moment and I gathered stones to mark my praise. And shall I tell you, will you believe me when I tell you, that on that day I dreamt I found the pebble you had hidden under the grape leaf? I saw it changed, crystallized into word and into meaning. If you would know this meaning, come with me, not far along the shore where grape trees cut a path by the sandbank. There you will hear a voice ancient with knowing that a man weary from seeking may find at last what he once sought in the arms of lovers, in the wide ocean's heart, in the pride of reason, a pebble changed into a pearl. And for this pearl, he trades his other kingdoms. And I do believe that I'm referring there, of course, to the biblical pearl of great price, and I have every reason to believe that George found that pearl. My next poem is called A Precipitate Sorrow. And some while ago, George did begin to prepare me for this ending. It's a while back, and it was after one of those conversations that I wrote this poem, A Precipitate Sorrow. It was precipitate then, it is very real now. A Precipitate Sorrow. I live too much in the now, the flame, the thunder of you. When you are gone, how often will I turn an evening silence into a rosary, coaxing the past with crystal beads if only if only, how will I unhear, 
untouched memory. How dilute your gaze, remove its essence like the air's varnish from all we loved. Perhaps the mystery dimmed now by the familiar will come again. And distance, the endless exile, will draw you closer beyond the feel of flesh. After months have passed, when it's only the wind and my fingers turning the pages, I'll read your conversations of age and innocence again. No longer your bright shadow over my shoulder, the lucent filter of your mind to clarify, expand, yet every message, each edict amplified by absence. I'm told I should ask all the questions now, record word and gesture, nuance and circumstance, as if time were mine to mediate, devise moment with meaning, arrange or label for future conveyors of history. And yet, I negotiate, make a dry run of tomorrow's grief against the long, slow hours, when I shall wish my heart a palimpsest, except that time and parting never can erase those moments you will write and write again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther Phillips, our Poet Laureate. And I now invite to deliver a tribute, close friend, Professor Anthony Bogues. Madam President of the Republic, Madam Prime Minister, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, family and friends of George Lamin. As I reflected on Lamin's life, a remarkable life of where he was born in the village of Carrington, of the island of his birth, Barbados, and then his profound literary and personal commitments to the Caribbean. I reflected and thought about these islands of the sea washed by the Caribbean Sea. These islands where, as Derek Walcott says, the sea is history. And here Walcott does not mean that it is just the Caribbean Sea that has history, but rather the entire Atlantic Ocean, of how these islands were born at the heart of the European colonial project. And then in the words of George, and here I quote him, the entire Caribbean society has rested on the complex of plantation slave society, slave society end of quote. And in this world that was rested on plantation slavery, a different kind of and distinctive kind of slavery in human history, not seen before, not just because of its violences, its systems of death and humiliation, because as a social system, it created a society in race in which race determined perpetual servitude what the historian as the Govail would call, created a group of people who would become property in person. Born 89 years after so-called emancipation in the Caribbean, Lamin had to confront the afterlives of this kind of plantation slavery and colonialism. He had to confront the afterlives 
in which history moved like a sedimented deposit, structuring the everyday lives of the society. In a 2014 interview we did, just recently published three weeks ago, he states, and here I quote him, I've always thought, George says, that I was lucky or blessed because from before I was in my teens, I was in secondary school and had already decided that I was a writer and thought of myself as a writer, he says, even before I wrote my first book, end of quote. Lamin, we know, was a writer, a novelist, a poet, and an essayist. And his six novels, from the first one of the, in the Castle of My Skin in the 1950s to the natives of my person, tells the story of this Caribbean, a Caribbean that begins in plantation slavery and colonialism, but a, plant but a Caribbean that also begins a journey of expectation. What he calls in that, 19, in that 2014 interview, a journey, he says, that is still insisting on being discovered." End of quote. This remarkable Caribbean man of letters was always searching because one of the things he was clear on was that these islands of the sea, peopled by histories of crossings of the Atlantic Ocean, had to confront who and what we are and that in confronting who and what we are, we had to have what he called in a conversation between himself and David Scott some years ago, a certain kind of sovereignty of the imagination. This work of the imagination for Lamin was not about literature or the literary. It was about a certain kind of imagination that had to do with the political, social, and yes, economic. And that at the heart of this work, heart of his own work, was, this where, was the imagination. But more importantly, I would argue, that at the heart of the work of the imagination was the, was the question of language. From 1956 at the Paris Conference, where he, in which he attended Black Writers Conference, in which there were folks like Fanon, Stephen Alexis from Haiti, Jean Priest Mars from Haiti, that remarkable Haitian intellectual, Amy Césaire, Richard Wright, and Leopold Senghor. From that, partic that particular conference, George presented in his speech, The Negro Writer and His World, a sentence in which he says, and here I quote him, a name is an infinite source of control, end of quote. This was the dilemma of the Caribbean. How do we name our own reality? And for Lamin, it was a kind of dilemma in which it required us to have a certain form of imagination that resided on the question of sovereignty. Because it was this sovereignty which would give us this capacity to name. In the seasons of adventure, he ended with this, with this and here I summarize, he ended with a statement the, all, the, all the republics would fall, he says, until they begin to use the language of the drum. And where did this language of the drum come from? It comes from, in Lawin's words, the people below. In a profound sense, this was the ground from which he operated. It was where his gaze was always focused. And we who live today, who inhabit these islands of the seas, in which the islands of the seas are in our bones. We who are here to celebrate a Caribbean life, a life of letters, but a life of remarkable audacity, intellectual and political, might have to think about this language of the drum and how do we structure ourselves around the language of the drum. George is now gone. He has gone to join the ancestors, C.L.R. James, Kamau Brathwaite, 
Derek Walcott, Walter Rodney, Algio Carpentier, Nicholas Gillian, Aunt Dyer, Rex Nickelford, amongst many others. And I can just imagine as I thought about this and all the others who have gone to join the ancestors, of them laughing and drinking over Caribbean rum and talking about the Caribbean. And I wonder about the keeper of the gates of these ancestral land and what he or she must be thinking about these audacious Caribbean souls. Something I'm sure that keeper has never seen before. So we celebrate George, but as we do so, we should remember what he himself thought about himself. And so I leave with these particular words, which he wrote in 2016, at the end of the new introduction to In the Castle of My Skin. The catapult ones, George says, of rights, have become the subject of their own history, engaged in a world, in a global war, to liberate their villages, rural and urban, from the old encirclement of poverty and fear. This, George says, is the most fundamental battle of our time. And I am joyfully lucky, and you can see the twinkling of his eye when he writes this, to have been made by my work a soldier in their ranks. But I would say that he was more than a soldier in their ranks a soldier in the ranks of those of us who want to have a different Caribbean, that he was really the anchor of our ideas, and the anchor about the, the possibilities of what we may become, of what we, the people of these islands of the sea, might one day fashion a different future. What good, my friend and brethren, your life will, and work will shine, leading us onwards, always. One love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Anthony Bogues. We will now have a performance of Body and Soul by Arturo Tappin, accompanied by Andre Daniel.
Body and Soul by Arturo Tappin, accompanied by Andre Daniel. George Lamming wrote, Federation may have failed to create common institutions, but the ceremony of marriage has certainly succeeded in reinforcing that earliest tradition of kinship by blood. To speak, therefore, of the Caribbean family is to speak of a collective and personal experience of the deepest intimacy. And this has been a dominant characteristic of the world of artists when we honor them, their recognition of common predicament, of common need, and of common destiny. It was once a condition of stability in this region to ignore the existence and to deny the human worth of the enormous majority of men and women whose labor made that order possible. The mark of their exclusion was the black skin. I know that there are those who tremble at the sound of that blunt and simple word, black, and who, apologizing for your own victimization, nervously anticipate a message of race. But when we say black, it has no biological meaning, nor is it used in the service of racial applause. When I say black, it is the name of a profound and unique historical experience born by a particular group of men and women whose presence in the world was destined to transform the eyes and ears of the world and whose ultimate liberation will be the decisive contribution to the liberation of mankind. George Lamming delivering the opening address at the Rex Nettleford Cultural Conference. I now invite his daughter, Natasha Lamming Lee, followed by his grandson, Johan Lee, to deliver family tributes. Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, members of cabinet, distinguished guests, friends and family. I am Natasha, the daughter and youngest child of George Lamming. We lost my older brother, Gordon William, last year. I have three children, and my brother Gordon has four beautiful daughters, so that George is the grandfather of seven. Of those, he has 10 great-grandchildren. So much has been said about my father in the last three weeks that I was not quite sure what was left to say. I then realized that my task would be to talk about a different aspect of his life, his personal life, his life as a family man, and his life as a father. As I look back, his life seemed to be divided into chapters, all different, but somehow connected in some way. The first chapter is well known. The only child of a single mother, he left home at an early age to teach at a school for Spanish boys in Trinidad. His days were filled with teaching at the school, meeting people, and exchanging ideas. One of the people he met was my mother, Nina Gent at the time, now Nina Squires. This led to the second chapter, the marriage. The marriage produced a son, Gordon William, and then took them to England separately by boat to start a new life. This was a journey of two young people leaving home for the first time, weeks of travel on a boat to start a new adventure. They both worked, she at the Indian High Commission in London, and he as a broadcaster for the BBC, and he did his writing. 
Out of this period came the novel for which he is best known in The Castle of My Skin. During this period, they met and made lifelong friends with fellow West Indians living in London at that time. John and Dorothy Figueroa, whose children, Anna, Peter, Mark, and Esther, would be here if they could today. Pearl and Edric Connor, who, I, who are my godparents, the Lowenthal's, Selvans, and another Barbadian icon, Carl Brudhagen, the artist. It was under his tutelage that my mother began her journey as a fine artist. The Guggenheim Award followed, and my mother returned to Trinidad, and my father set off on his journey, which ended three weeks ago on June the 4th, 2022. He was not a conventional father, but he was always a presence in our lives. He checked in when he could, and I believe that he was comfortable because he knew that my brother and I were in good hands with my mother. Luckily for us, his mother, Loretta Medford, who we fondly called Tourette, moved to Trinidad soon after my mother returned. And so our connection to Barbados was solidified through her cooking, her accent, and her love. It is a wonderful thing that our children, my three, and my brother's two elder children, Natalie and Dahlia, were also able to experience their Bajan grandmother, um, who loved them all very dearly. The next few chapters would take him all over the world, meeting people, exchanging ideas, feeling strongly for his comrades, Bishop and Rodney. These were difficult times for him. And he then returned to Bathsheba, which was truly his happy place. It is one of the most beautiful places that I have seen. My children and I visited him there, where they learned that life can exist without television, phones, or video games. Gordon's girls, Natalie and Dahlia, were also uh, lucky to have visited him at the Atlantis in Bathsheba during those days. His stints in the United States allowed him to visit with us, and we got to experience his love of music, sports, cable news, and good food. He had an insatiable love of reading for long hours. He was a man before his time, but he was also a little behind the times. He would not engage with a computer. He exchanged emails, but wherever he was, he assigned someone to do it for him. I felt for them. <laughs> I have heard him described in the superlative by many in the past weeks, but the word that I think describes him best is courageous. Few people at an early age can commit to what their life's work will be. One cannot argue that to do the best of one's ability, one should have no diversion no distraction. My father was a master at that. For decades, he dedicated his life to exploring the power of the word. He had a wonderful delivery of it. He felt the need to share his thoughts and dreams for a future society with young writers and developing minds. He did this at sometimes great sacrifice of his family but he kept the goal in mind. I have not always understood the passion that drove him, but when I see the lives that he has touched, the teaching, discussions, collaborations, and friendships that he has forged, I accept that this is what he had to do. 
I can only hope that those lives he impacted will keep it going, that his life will be an inspiration to young Caribbean writers and thinkers, so that his personal sacrifices will not be in vain. My father was laid to rest yesterday, on the 30th of June, 2022, in a private burial at his request. May he rest in peace. I will miss your voice. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha, and we now invite Johan Lee. Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, members of the Cabinet, special guests, friends, and family. It is both an honor and a privilege to be, participate this morning in tribute to my grandfather. As George's only grandson and the youngest of the lot, this morning I speak for Natalie, Dahlia, Tanya, and Talisha when I say that we will miss him dearly and know that we will remember him every day that we look in the mirror and see these early onset gray hairs. <laughs> Sorry, Ma. I came today to share a portion of a short essay that George wrote titled Casa de las Americas from what he described to us as his most ambitious work, The Enterprise of the Indies. Following the Cuban Revolution of 1959, Casa de las Americas was born and served as the hub for artistic expression within the region. The revolution had exercised the demon of fear he explained that revolutionary struggle is incomplete without a cultural base that informs and humanizes the social practice of those who participated in its triumph. Casa embraced all areas of artistic expression, including a publishing house, a department of music and drama, a school in the plastic arts, recording studios for popular music, and readings from the contemporary works of Latin American and Caribbean writers. This platform of authentic cultural expression catalyzed the progress made within the hemisphere. Ironically, by doing this, he describes that Cuba had committed the greatest of all crimes. Cuba had chosen to be Cuba. By demonstrating a strong sense of their own identity, they were able to influence and impact the larger hemisphere. Those who knew my grandfather well should recognize the parallels in George's unforgiving sense of self, the sovereignty of spirit, and what came of it. He closed the essay with an interesting metaphor which I'd like to share directly. My grandfather said, in Haitian religious culture, there's a remarkable drama of encounter between the living and the dead called the ceremony of souls. In every family, as you know, there will be disputes which remain unresolved after some of the contending parties have died. There are disputes over property, disputes over problems of love. There are disputes over some profound conflict of belief and commitment. And it is one of the contingencies of fate that some of us will die before others, a father before his son, a daughter before her mother. But death does not bring to an end the turbulence of these conflicts. The dead refuse to go away, to leave the living alone. According to Haitian mythology, the dead after burial are imprisoned in water and cannot be liberated into eternity, which is the ultimate freedom until they have reconciled their differences with those who they have survived them. In other words, the future of the dead depends to a large extent on the collaboration of the living. The ceremony of souls is the occasion when, by the invocation of music, song, dance, and prayer, the dead return for their final dialogue with the living. The ceremony of souls becomes a theater in which the most honorable battles are conclusively fought. And the central act reveals an identity of interest and a triumph of reconciliation. Casa de las Americas recreates the ceremony of souls in which the scattered families of this hemisphere, dead and alive, return time and again for a continuing dialogue of solidarity and struggle and love. It is the house of reconciliation. There's no doubt that for many of us, the past few weeks have been challenging. However, to say that I don't feel ever closer to my family, my country, my people, my grandfather, and ultimately myself would be dishonest. 
And what that tells me is that George is still at work. I plead with you all this morning. Do not take this celebration of a soul for granted. To see a strong, intellectual black man celebrated by his nation is a relatively new experience for those of us who live in the States. As a former elementary school principal, I look up. I recognize the imprint that these efforts can leave on a formative mind. I also recognize the demand for such celebrations as our children are currently inundated with poisonous imagery hidden behind screens that are attached to their hands. Again, I thank those responsible for such an important and impressive production. And though I joked earlier, I want you all to know that we will wear our platinum crowns with our heads held high and carry his blood not in vain. We are with him as he is with us. So my grandfather, I want you to know that though you close your eyes, you've opened many more. I pray that we all continue the dialogue of solidarity and struggle and love as he would want in order to be free. Thank you. Thank you very much, grandson Johan Lee. Our next performer wrote this song, Flood Waters, after reading the works of Lamming. Please welcome Dr. the Most Honorable Anthony Gabby Carter and Flood Waters. want to say that this song is one of nine songs I wrote in about an hour and a half at Sissy Spence across his home as we were <clears throat> preparing to do a tribute to the great George Lamming at University of the West Indies. And this one stood with me. Flood waters rushing down again The village filled with rain They singing happy birthday Flood waters today I'm nine years old My mom God bless her soul She's singing happy birthday But through it all I'm feeling all so sad Wishing for the dad I never had Oh, today is such an awful day Wish the flood waters would wash my tears away Flood waters rushing through the roof Rain, it speaks the truth While they sing Happy birthday Flood waters Rushing through the roof The rain, it speaks the truth While they sing Happy birthday But through it all I'm feeling oh so sad Wishing for the dad I never had Oh, today is such an awful day Wish the flood waters would wash my tears away Flood waters Flood mm -hmm. waters Happy birthday, flat 
waters rushing on my head, soon to be on my bed, while they singing happy birthday. But through it all, I'm feeling oh so sad, wishing for the that I never had. Oh, today is such an awful day. Wish the flood waters would wash my tears away. Flood waters. Mm. Flood waters. Mm. George. Judge, no rain could keep you down in no country, no town. No rain could keep you down. You fought poverty and came to me as a mentor, an author, a lecturer, a professor. A doctor, that's what you are. Flood waters, flood waters could never keep you down. Could never keep you down. Your activist, what is this? I reminisce. On who you are, to me you're a star, to me you're a hero. I want the whole world to know my friend George Lamin is a hero. Flood waters rushing down the hill, the village full with rain, while they sing Happy Birthday, Flood waters. Mm-hmm. Waters. Mm-hmm. Waters. And now I invite to address us the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Madam President, members of cabinet, members of the Lamming family in particular, Natasha and George's grandchildren, distinguished Barbadians and Caribbean people all. This is an amazing country. Not perfect, but amazing. I want to start differently by thanking those of you, the Lamming family, the cabinet office, and the National Cultural Foundation for preparing for us this morning a ceremony whose dignity and graciousness is perhaps only outperformed and outmatched by George's words, the dignity and grace and beauty of his words. And I do so because death is never easy. But for us to be able to say farewell in a manner as dignified as we do this morning is a tribute to us all and to the nation to which we belong. I said we were amazing 
but not perfect. And not perfect because, in a very real sense, much of what we gather to do daily reflects the battle of George's life. How do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? How do we remove from our presence the plantation of the mind that has the power to outlive the plantation that was physically represented across every parish of our nation. And I say so, conscious that less than one year ago, as a nation, we determined that we should be responsible for our own destiny in all that that matters and means. And that, in a very real sense, is the confidence that we express as a people. But that confidence hasn't just come through serendipity. It has come through the toiling and efforts of people like George, of those from the political sphere, of those from the artistic sphere, of those ordinary hawkers who line the street behind us in Robert Street for centuries, of those who labored for a better life for as many of our people as possible. And I say so because our generation takes too much for granted, even those of us who, like myself, our children of independence. I ask us this morning to reflect on three things. And ironically, Natasha, you touch the first. To reflect on the courage of George. Not only the courage to determine what his life's work would be as a young man, but the courage to express himself in a way that others did not find possible or could not find the voice so to do. That he should have done it in that <clears throat> most expressive way to give voice to what the average Barbadian felt across every village, across every nook and cranny but to do it when he did it. Less than 20 years after the great revolution of 1937 reflects a courage that we should never, never take for granted. In the castle of my skin said so much for each and every Barbadian and Caribbean person. And long before Lloyd Bess and others spoke of the plantation economy, George Lamming put the issue frontally for the Caribbean to address. Perhaps in his own way, he was fighting the battles through literature that Eric Williams fought through the expression of research and history. The second thing is his compassion his care, care for those who could not be seen, care for those who could not be heard. And many of you may hear me speak all the time about seeing people, hearing people, and feeling people. I claim no original authorship of these words or concepts, but I simply find a desire to join the chorus of compassion that has been so ably shaped by George and others of this Caribbean civilization. For too many centuries, our people were not seen, our people were not heard, and our people were not felt. 
and whether it is within the confines of our own nation or the expanse of our region or the possibilities required of us in the world in which we live, that commitment to compassion must ever be present every day and every night because it is in the least of us those who we see, those who we hear, and those who we feel at all levels, that we will reflect better the perfection of this society. And the third thing relates to commitment. No one ever had to doubt George's commitment, for his commitment remained ever-present and unapologetically so. I learned that as a young minister of culture when I first met him. And I understood that even when I invited him to speak on behalf of the government, or for the people, I should say, with respect to July 26, that date of our revolution, which too many refused to acknowledge and simply wanted to reflect on it as an expression of unruliness by the people of this nation. George knew better and taught us better. And that today we have the monument of Golden Square and the Republic of Barbados is due in no small measure to the life, work, and times of men like George Lamming and others who I could reflect on. This generation must not take for granted that which we have inherited. Yesterday, I had cause to speak about the relay of Caribbean development. This is a relay race. And George has done well by running it. We shall forever remember his booming distinctive voice, his unmistakable head of unruly hair, and I say so as one who shares that passion, <laughs> only to have completed the platinum or gray for which Johan spoke. And of course, his calm demeanor, always reflecting an indelible image of contemplative resolve. I'm happy, young boys and girls, that I had the opportunity as Minister of Education to choose the site upon which the school that carries his name now finds itself. And there can be no greater reflection of our pride than for you to wear always the name of your school with honor and to recognize that for you, you have now come to be associated with a giant and a national icon. I pray that George's spirit will imbue in us as a people that same sense of courage, compassion, and commitment to which I referred. And I recall, as I said on the day on which he passed, that this quintessential Barbadian, this quintessential Bajan, has done so much to allow us to be. And in this year, last year, those expressions to which I referred, both the Republic and the tangible expression of gratitude at Golden Square, I lay also at the feet of George Lamming. That lecture 
which I asked him to give was in fact at Golden Square at the time. My friends, this country must come to honor appropriately our giants. And I refer to George, I refer to Kamau, I refer to Tom Clark. I can go on and refer to others living like Esther, but we must come to appreciate that our determination to salute them is not about big man or big woman, but it is about sustaining, sustaining the worthiness and honor of their message. I pray that we come together as a nation to do so as gracefully and as graciously as befits the man. May his spirit imbue in us that sense of courage, commitment, and compassion always. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. George's daughter, Natasha, shared with us that he had a love of classical music, of the calypsos of the Mighty Gabby, and you heard the Mighty Gabby, and the vocal stylings of Nina Simone. I now invite to sing Feeling Good, Shadia Marshall. sky you know how I feel breeze jetting on by you know how I feel it's a new dawn new day new life for me And I'm feeling good Fish in the sea You know how I feel River running free You know how I feel Last time on the tree You know how I feel It's a new dawn, a new day a new life for me and I'm feeling good Dragonfly out in the sun you know how I feel butterflies having fun you know what I mean sleep in peace when the day is done that's what I mean Oh, this whole world, it's a new world for me. 
Sharia Marshall and Feeling Good. And my final excerpt from the writings of George Lamming goes like this. We cannot predict the shape of this explosive resurrection of new needs and new energies, but it's here, your new landscape as well as mine. The world from which our reciprocal ways of seeing has sprung was once Prospero's world, but it is no longer his. Moreover, it will never be his again. It is ours, the legacy of many centuries, demanding of us a new kind of effort, a new kind of sight for viewing the possible horizons of our century. Let the future make whatever judgments the errors of the future will allow, but accept the fact that we are here seeing and being seen in a certain way. An extract from The Pleasures of Exile by George Lamming. And to deliver closing remarks, please welcome Mrs. Carla Springer Hunt. Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Mortley, members of Cabinet, former Prime Minister, Mr. Frondel Stewart, ambassadors and members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Judiciary, members of the Senate and the House of Assembly, senior public officials, Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles and colleagues, from the University of the West Indies, members of the family of the Honorable George Lamin, principal, staff, and students of the George Lamin Primary School, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all. I first met Professor Lamin at the Atlantis Hotel, where my dad introduced me to his friend, whom he met long before I was born with this large afro of very white hair. I was in awe of him then, as I am now. Many years later, he moved between Brown University and the Cave Hill campus. He became Professor George and my mentor. Shortly after that, we became friends, and he became my Uncle George. When he returned to Barbados as professor and writer in residence at the UWI, my office was right next to his, in the building carrying his name, and I unofficially became his official secretary. <laughs> According to our colleagues, including, including Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, I was the protector of George, while a few others called me George's pit bull, as you had to go through me to get to him. I would often sit in my office and hear him say, yes, 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 speak to Miss Springer and arrange a suitable time to meet me. I kept his diary, and yes, Natasha, I sorted his emails because he hated the computer. And I typed his letters, along with my own university work, of course. We discussed everything, whatever piqued his interest, in the daily newspaper, in the several books and journals and papers he carried in his ever-present canvas bag with the two long straps. We argued, sorry, I didn't argue with him. I listened intently as he expressed his opinions on local and international politics, cricket, and of course, culture, as well as my favorite topics of theater and creative entrepreneurship. We shared lunch and cracked jokes. Yes, Lamin loved a good joke, and his ability to tell you a joke with a very straight face and that twinkle in his eyes while you were busy busting your guts at the seams with laughter was impeccable. He was always busy, always reading, always writing, but his door was always opened to everyone, but especially to his students, as he was always ready to share his vast knowledge and experiences with everyone who knocked on his door. He was equally eager to hear how their studies were progressing and how he could assist them further. 
as a member of the last cohort of students in his creative writing class at the Cave Hill campus, along with Dr. Kieran Lord, Shakira Bourne, and Theo Williams, to name a few. He always reminded us to write what we knew and to write it from the heart. Today, my final task as protector of George is to thank all of you who have contributed to this beautiful service. To the government of Barbados with assistance from the Cabinet Office, the National Cultural Foundation, the Central Bank of Barbados, and the Lamin family, we thank you for paying such a wonderful tribute to such an honorable gentleman. Thank you to the Barbados National Youth Orchestra String Ensemble, Shekina Roach, Arturo Tappin, and Shakita Marshall for their exquisite performances this morning. Very special thanks to the students of George Lamin Primary School for their rendition of their school song, Imagine, Create, and Achieve. Professor Lamin would have no doubt been very proud of seeing your performance. And to the most honorable, Dr. the most honorable Anthony Gabby Carter for his tearing performance of Floodwaters. To Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Dr. Alison Leacock, Professor Aaron Kamagisha, Professor Richard Drayton, and Professor Anthony Bogues, we thank you all for your sterling tributes to this giant of a Caribbean man. To the family of Professor George, his daughter Natasha, his grandson Johan, and his Esther, thank you for sharing your personal tributes with us. We are very truly grateful. To the Honorable Mia Moore Mortley, Prime Minister of Barbados, we thank you for giving us of your time to speak on behalf of our people. We are proud Bajans and very proud of our own George Lamming. And a hearty thank you to our host, Mrs. Carol Roberts Reefer, for holding this ex hosting this excellent memorial service for us. Last but, but, but by no means least, I would like to thank you all for being present today especially those of you who travel to Barbados to say your final goodbyes, in tribute to the man and his words. Whoever he was to you, Daddy, Professor Lamin, George, G, Grand George, the man who named on the school, Mr. Lamin, or Uncle George, whoever he was to you, I have no doubt that you were important to him. Whether you read one of his books, or all of his books and papers, or none at all. His country, Barbados, and our people have always been important to him. May we always remember his deep intellectual voice, his powerful pen, his philosophical teachings, and his great legacy, which will weave its way through many, many generations to come. Walk good, Uncle George. Enjoy your journeys with the ancestors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Carla Springer Hunt. I now invite you to stand for the departure of Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados. And on behalf of the Cabinet Office, we want to thank you very much for braving the Friday morning showers to come out this morning for this very important memorial. And we do wish you a safe journey home and a very good weekend. Good morning. <laughs>